Okay, today we're going to look at chapter two of Mosby's Pharmacy Technician Principles and Practice, which is all about pharmacy law. We're going to look at the history of federal drug laws in chronological order. I'm going to tell you right now that you're probably going to have a lot of these on um, some national exam of yours. Uh, usually the PTCB has quite a few things and it's best to learn them with the year attached because some of them sound alike, but they were done in different years. Okay. So the practice of pharmacy is governed by a series of laws, regulations, and rules. So they're not always all the same thing. Some are laws, some are regulations, some are rules. Um, they're enforced by federal, state, and local government, some institutions, and pharmacy management. Uh, a lot of these are actually um, from the, the um, FDA, and then some of them are from the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, or the FDA, uh, Food and Drug Administration, and some of them are governed by the state boards of pharmacy. So we have to be able to understand these laws for passing the PTC certification exam, PTCB, and for employment. The history of the FDA is really important in pharmacy. The FDA is under the direction of the Department of Health and Human Services, and their main function, and this comes up quite often, is to enforce guidelines for manufacturers to ensure safety and effectiveness of medications. So those are two extremely important things. A medication can be highly effective, but it's not necessarily safe, or it could be safe, but it's not very effective. So, um, the, you know, the perfect ideal for a new drug it, it, is that it is both safe and effective. Early on, like before the 1900s, um, the FDA came about, um, the FDA came about because of, largely because of The Jungle, which was a book by Upton Sinclair. And it was about a young man who came to the US from Lithuania and started working in a meat processing plant. And it was a novel, but it was based on true events. Back in those days, um, in the, the early 1900s, um, manufacturing plants weren't inspected. And so people would just trust that everything was done correctly and things like rats or even sometimes on the line, people would cut themselves and their blood would get into the sausage mixture or rats or um, fingers, things like that. So that um, book, The Jungle, exposed a lot of things and it sort of led to, um, in a large part, led to the um, formation of the FDA. So early on, the FDA investigated the adulteration and misbranding of agricultural goods used for food and drugs. Adulteration means it has things in it that it shouldn't have, like, you know, rats if you're buying beef, that kind of thing, or selling horse meat and saying that it was, you know, beef. Um, and so, but they didn't have the ability to regulate <clears throat> or enforce their own rules. They had no teeth. It was a law, you know, it was like a tiger with no teeth. And then in the 1930s, they actually gained the right to inspect factories and they gained the right to control the advertising of products. And it took a horrendous event to pass these new standards. Um, in 1937, a Tennessee drug company, it was called the Massengill Company, um, and it was a big drug company, and they they advertised it in a new sulfonilamide elixir specifically aimed toward children and um, the solvent on it the solvent that it had that made the drug um, actually dissolve in liquid was um, antifreeze so but they didn't know that it was uh, ethylene glycol and it was very similar to antifreeze which is deadly to humans and 104 people died and they were mostly children all right, settle down. Look, the dog wants to say hi. Actually, he wants me to play with him, but I'm not going to. I'm sorry. No. Okay. And the other dog just isn't enough fun, I guess. Okay. So this terrible thing that happened in the 1930s, uh, there were very few antibiotics. And the first thing that came out that would kill bacteria was the, a sulfa drug. And it was actually um, discovered in a chemical that was used in the dye industry. So then they came out with, they called it sulfa, 
um, that it was sulfanilamide and it was available in tablet and powder form, but it didn't dissolve well in liquid. So in those days, in 1937, there was a lot of um, throat infections going around because of the bacteria. And so they could treat adults with this sulfanilamide, but they didn't have something that would work for children. And so I'm gonna have you guys read an article about this and I want you to tell me about it. You're going to answer some questions about this event because it was extremely important in the history of uh, medicine in the United States, okay? So early on in the FDA, one of the things they came up with was called USP, which was the United States Pharmacopeia. And originally it was just a list of drugs that are legal to use in the US or that the US recognizes but doesn't necessarily make lawful. And then they came up with the national formulary, the, US, the uh, USPNF, and F means national formulary. And the drugs that are on this listing and are okay to use, they have to meet the standards of strength, quality, purity, um, and not necessarily efficacy though, okay? So they weren't concerned that much with efficacy because in this, at this point in time, they're looking at how safe a drug is, especially after what happened with the sulfanilamide. And I'm not sure why it's not, what, there we go, okay. So now, um, if you guys remember, um, you probably don't remember, but they're starting to bring it back, the um, little songs and things about different um, civic things. Um, an act is a statutory plan passed by Congress or any legislature, which is a bill until it's enacted and becomes a law. And then an amendment is a change in that original act or law. So we have to know the difference there. An act is only a bill until it becomes a law. In 1906, so we're now we're going back before the FDA, there was something called the Pure Food and Drug Act. This is also called the Wiley Act because that is the politician that originally wrote it and brought it up before Congress or the Senate and uh, asked for them to pass it. So the reason for this is that um, Inaccurately labeled drugs were something that they wouldn't label anything. And so manufacturers were, um, I'm looking for a book I have about this, which is really quite interesting. It's all about patent medicines. Patent medicines uh, were medications that people would sell and tell you that they would do certain things. And they were basically, many times they were just alcohol, which of course, if you're all depressed and you drink something, you might feel better. Um, or if a woman was excitable and she drank some alcohol, she would of course calm down. And so they would put these things in bottles and sometimes even add opium elixir to it, which really calmed people down. And they would sell it and they would say that it would cure things like baldness or stomach ache or earache or toothache. And of course it would dull pain, so it sold a lot. Um, but the patent medicine um, thing was really interesting. So this book is written by Gerald Carson and it's called One for a Man, Two for a Horse. And it shows a man and a horse both taking this elixir that is supposed to cure them um, from the Pratt Food Company. So it's a history of patent medicines and it's a really old book. Um, it was written in 1961, so it's a little bit older than me, a little bit. Um, but it's really interesting because it, the advertising they used to do, like here is one that's supposed to improve the appearance of a woman. And if you look at this picture, it's basically like a corset. It just pushes her bust up and therefore makes her more attractive, right? So um, these kinds of things were not just medicines, but also contraptions. But for medicines, the manufacturers have to prove that truthful information is on the label before a drug is sold, and it has to prove the drug's effectiveness. Not necessarily safety. And then in 1912, they had an international opium convention. And this uh, was a big deal because opium is uh, from opium poppies. There's actually a flower called the opium poppy. It's grown now mostly in Afghanistan. That's the, where the largest amount comes from these days. 
Um, but it was really, really popular in China, and China had just uh, opened up to the world, and, and people were going there, um, and a lot of other Asian countries, but mostly China. And so people that were visiting there were um, smoking opium or discovering the joys of enjoying opium, either in an elixir or by smoking it. And so this became a problem. And so the different governments got together and decided to um, try to curb the rise in controlled substances trafficking, but it wasn't a controlled substance then. There was no control over any of this at the time. In 1914, um, the U.S. Uh, representatives had come back from this International Opium Convention, and now they're coming back and they're trying to um, see what we can do about this here in the U.S. And the Harrison Narcotics Act uh, was enacted to curb the recreational use of opium. Now, when we look at opium, it is a powerful um, drug that stops the transmission of pain signals to the brain from the part of the body that hurts. And even now, um, even now, this is the most powerful thing that we have to control pain. People that are dying of, from cancer, all of the drugs that we use to treat pain came out of um, chemist's original research on opium. So because of that, drugs that are derived from opium are called opiates. And um, then we have drugs that are chemically synthesized, but they're similar to opiates. So the chemical structures are going to be very similar. Okay, and those are called opioids if they're synthetic and opiates if they come directly from the opium poppy. Okay. So the Harrison Narcotics Act came about to curb the recreational use of opium because we had an excessive number of opium addicts in the US and opium was an ingredient in a lot of elixirs that were supposed to help with a lot of different things. Um, and they're still trying, I mean, at this point, 1914, they were still trying to um, prevent manufacturing companies from making false claims. So the act was a direct result of the 1912 International Opium Convention. It said that opium is no longer available without a prescription and that records have to be required and must be kept for prescriptions and importation and distribution were restricted. However, if you look at prescriptions in those days, they were handwritten on paper. Druggists, uh, which was our pharmacists in those days, they were called druggists, they were required to keep them. And so they kept them in, the, every pharmacy would have a cabinet with a lot of drawers in it. And they would just put the prescriptions from a specific day, um, you know, in a drawer. And maybe a drawer would hold several months worth of prescriptions. And they would keep them as long as they had room in their drawers for these things. But if somebody were to go back and look at those prescriptions, and we have lots and lots of examples of prescriptions that were written in the early 1900s, um, a lot of them would have something like Mrs. Johnson written for the patient. We don't know which Mrs. Johnson, and there was no date of birth and no address, and of course nobody had a phone in those days, so there was no telephone number. So um, you can restrict the importation and distribution, but there's nothing to stop Mrs. Johnson from seeing a different doctor getting a prescription and going to a different pharmacy. Um, and so things like that would happen. And you know, this is still an issue today is that people will come up with these, um, sorry, I need to let someone in. Um, they would come up with these personas and go and see different doctors and go to different pharmacies and get multiple prescriptions. So in 1984, the FDA approved the use of opiates um, way back before 1984, actually, they approved the use of opiates in um, some medications. However, heroin still remains a schedule one drug. And that was the original, um, the original uh, heroin is the tar exactly from the flower itself. So um, it was the first thing that came out of the opium poppies was heroin. So it's still a Schedule I drug, which means it has no legal use in the United States. In 1938, 
um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act came about. It was enacted because the 1906 law was not worded strictly enough and did not include cosmetics. So you might ask, why do they have to put cosmetics in the Food and Drug Act? Well, one, there were two things specifically that were in a lot of cosmetics that was very harmful. And the strange thing is even today, you can still find them in some countries. The first one was lead. Lead is um, very white when you mix it into a compound, um, especially like a facial lotion. And so it makes the skin lighter. And as somebody who tried to tan all through the 70s and ended up with precancerous lesions that had to be removed, um, I kind of have to say, I'm not really understanding the whole thing way back in the olden days where women wanted very light skin. Um, light skin shows any kind of, of blemish um, much more easily than darker skin. And I wanted to tan very badly in the 70s and it did not happen. But I do have a lot of freckles because I'm partly Irish, I found out later. Um, thank you, Ancestry.com. So, <laughs> um, lead was in a lot of medications, and it's still in medications from other countries that are supposed to be uh, not allowed in the U.S., but sometimes they come in through back doors. The other one is arsenic. Arsenic is another skin lightener that um, women would use. And, of course, lead and arsenic are both poisons, and they come from natural sources. Lead is mined right out of the ground. Um, and I'm not sure where arsenic comes from, but it is also extremely dangerous. So um, that's why they put the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, uh, that's why it included cosmetics in there. So it required drug companies to include directions to the consumer regarding how to use a drug and also package inserts. And then if a drug is considered addictive um, and we didn't really have what we call controlled substances in those days, but if it was considered addictive, it had to have a warning label on it warning may be habit forming. Now, a lot of people are going to say that, see that and say that's not a very strong warning. I mean, anything can become a habit. And there is a very addictive sus substance that is just all over the earth. And a lot of people are addicted to it. My drug of choice, caffeine. However, it doesn't cause people to not be able to drive. In fact, if I don't have caffeine in the morning, I don't think I drive to work very well because I have a bad headache. So um, anyway, caffeine is not a controlled substance, but it is highly addictive. It's important for cosmetics to be accurately labeled and tested for purity and safety because even though they're used externally, they could either cause a rash or they could be absorbed through the skin or they could enter the body um, and cause harm in another way. It also defined the exact labeling for products and defined misbranding and adulteration as illegal. So misbranding again is if it um, tells you that it's one thing, but it's really something else. And adulteration is when it um, includes things that should not be in there. So uh, the Food, Drug and Cosmetics Act uh, requires food, a mandatory food labeling, standards of identity, um, so in other words, it has to use terms that everyone is familiar with in order to identify things. Uh, right now, there's a controversy over fabric, okay, because some fabric from other countries might contain um, a, an unnatural fiber called polyester, but it might label it something like PLA or something else on the label from the clothing. So if you see those ads that pop up on Facebook all the time, for, and it'll say something like Rose Lynn or some other company like that, and it's clothing from China. And sometimes if you click on that, it's really hard to find out what the fabric is made of. And um, I, actually, I actually like to reuse clothing that contains polyester because polyester doesn't break down in, um, in uh, the landfill. And so it's like, it's similar to a plastic. It's around forever, but it has a couple of good qualities. If you mix cotton with polyester, if they wind the strands together, then that cotton fabric will not shrink up like it does so terribly if it's pure cotton. 
Also, um, a polyester cotton blend fabric has proved to block in when you make a cloth face mask out of it, it will block twice as much germs as pure cotton alone. So I have to laugh at all these people on, um, on social media that are saying, only buy organic cotton to make your face mask. Well, polyester does not irritate the skin for most people, and not any more than cotton does if you wear it close to your face for a long period of time. However, it does block more bacteria and germs than, um, than pure cotton. And the, the way to tell if a fabric is good for a face mask or not is to hold it up to the light and see how much you can see through it. So compare different fabrics and the one that blocks the most light has tighter weave fabric and that's also going to block the most germs. But a lot of people just look at that, you know, organic cotton label and they think that's the best and it's actually one of the worst for making face masks. So I'm going to throw that out there. Okay, so uh, standards of identity, like what do we call these types of things? What do we call um, high fructose corn syrup? You know, they used to call it other things. Um, they had other names for it. And also information on imitation foods. Uh, imitation foods are things that uh, taste good, but don't necessarily have, um, they're not really considered foods because the body just passes them on through. Some of those are actually good for you. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what they're talking about with imitation foods, um, but some fibers could be considered imitation foods. And then nutritional information for special dietary foods. And they also provided the legal status for the Food and Drug Administration. So remember FDA came along when, let's see, um, 1906, 1912, 1914, 19. 38. Um, so the FDA came along uh, right in here, and but it really didn't have any teeth until the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So it was like, yeah, there's this thing called, you know, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, but they didn't do anything until around the 1930s. 1951, we had the Durham-Humphrey Amendment. Um, these were two uh, either state representatives or congressmen, and I don't remember what they were, but one of them was Hubert Humphrey, and my dad was a fan of Hubert Humphrey, so I remember that name. Um, and so the Durham-Humphrey Amendment, they came together and they wrote this thing, and basically, if you wanted to purchase something, if you went into a grocery store, you would go up to the clerk at the counter and you would say, I need a can of peas, I need a bag, a 10 pound bag of flour, I need a two pound bag of sugar. And they would actually package this stuff up for you. And then you could take it out to your wagon and haul it home. Um, and if you wanted uh, medication, you would walk into the pharmacy and you would hand the pharmacist your prescription and you would hand them your list and they would get everything on your list, which to me is kind of like, like a personal shopper. I would like that. The only problem is you couldn't sneak things through the check stand or go to go to self check so that people wouldn't know what you were buying. So the grocer's wife was one of the biggest sources of gossip. And even as far as the pharmacy goes, there weren't laws uh, regarding patient privacy in those days. So when I have students in my class, I like to show an episode of the Andy Griffith Show. It's the uh, season two, episode one. Um, and I really like it because it's called Miss Ellie Comes to Town and she is a pharmacist. And her uncle Fred owns the pharmacy right there in Mayberry. Um, and, but uncle Fred is sick. So she comes to run the pharmacy for uncle Fred. And Andy just thinks she's beautiful and smart and he is in awe of her, but he is such an old fashioned man that he just, he calls her the lady druggist. And aren't you a pretty one? And it's just, it cracks me up now because this is the kind of thing that um, as far as, uh, she had no respect in town as a woman. If she had been Uncle Fred, they wouldn't have questioned her at all. But there's a woman that wants um, her pills, Emma Brand. She's an older woman and she wants her pills, but she doesn't have her doctor's prescription. It's a very old prescription. It's several years old. And so Miss Ellie needs to get a prescription from Mrs. Brandt's daughter, do yeah, her doctor. 
So she tells Mrs. Brandt that she has to get a new prescription and Mrs. Brandt just does not understand that at all. She doesn't wanna go see her doctor and it turns out that the entire town turns against Ellie and is angry with her for not giving Mrs. Brandt her pills. Well, her pills are placebos, which is what they, they used to call them sugar pills. And so she would pay 10 cents for a bottle of these pills that were just sugar pills and she would, you know, feel better because of the placebo effect. I took a pill, now I feel better. Um, so in 1951, and the original Andy Griffith show, I believe, was in uh, 60 or 61, right in there, or maybe even 1959, um, the Durham-Humphrey Amendment had passed, but a lot of people didn't understand what it meant. So I think this was good of the Andy Griffith show to kind of educate people on that, because Miss Ellie says that she's not allowed to talk to the sheriff about Mrs. Brant's pills because that's between Mrs. Brandt and her doctor and the pharmacy. So that's also a really good way of explaining um, our modern HIPAA laws as well. Some things need to be kept private. So um, the Durham-Humphrey Amendment came up with what they call the legend, okay? The legend is just this written warning here that says, caution federal law, prohibits dispensing without a prescription. And I was going to highlight it, but I'm not in highlight mode. So this requires a doctor's order and supervision for certain drugs. So this makes the initial distinction by, between legend drugs, which means prescription only, and OTC medications, which is over-the-counter. OTC stands for over-the-counter medications that do not require a doctor's order. So those are non-prescription drugs or non-legend drugs. Um, in 1962, the Kefauver Harris Amendment passed, and this was enacted in an attempt to ensure the safety and effectiveness of all new drugs on the market. And again, Kefauver and Harris were two politicians who wrote this amendment, and it passed in 1962. Now, this puts the burden on manufacturers to ensure good manufacturing practice. Now, we call this GMP, and all drug companies that manufacture drugs. It's supposed to be in the entire world, um, but there are certain limits on that, of course, but especially in the US. Um, that means that if they're making a drug that contains opium, then they need to clean all of the equipment before they make another drug that doesn't contain opium. So, and that's called good manufacturing practice. So the drugs don't contaminate each other. So you don't take an aspirin and uh, have an allergic reaction and think that you're allergic to aspirin when maybe you could have been allergic to something that was made on that equipment before the aspirin was made. So there's a lot of reasons why we want good manufacturing practice. Also, if they're going to make so many milligrams of a drug, they need to use good manufacturing practice to make sure that the drugs contain that many milligrams. Now, uh, this Kefauver Harris Amendment became very important um, in the 1960s because there was a drug called thalidomide. And so this was used for morning sickness in Europe. It was very popular in the UK. And so they thought it was harmless. They let women take it during pregnancy for morning sickness. And then what happened was a lot of those kids were born with birth defects. Um, and the birth defects were extremely um, egregious. In fact, some of the children would be born without arms and legs, or they would have a small hand attached to their shoulder and no actual arm itself, or their feet would come out around their knees somewhere. It caused serious birth defects. So other examples of recalled drugs, phenylpropanolamine, which in my opinion should not have been recalled because it was safe used as directed. It was not safe when they put it in over-the-counter diet pills, which they did. So in 2000, they pulled phenylpropanolamine off the market instead of making it prescription only. So I have an issue with that one. I don't always agree with all of our laws. And sometimes I think there should be more. So you just kind of kind of look at this and you know decide for yourself. But we still have to follow these laws. Um, there was a COX-2 inhibitor, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug in 2004 called Viox. Viox caused a lot of people to have heart attacks. And then of course in 1937, sulfonylamide elixir, which doesn't fall under the Kefauver-Harris Amendment because it happened way before that. 
1967, we have the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act. Now, a lot of these laws that came about came about after the 1950s. So the ones that really started it all, in my opinion, was the Durham-Humphrey Amendment, okay? So there were only a few laws before this that you need to memorize. After this, we get a whole bunch of them um, because now we're seeing things that, that need to be taken care of, so they pass a law. So the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act applies to labels on consumer products. It has to state the identity of the product, the name and place of the business manufacturer, packer, or distributor. Here's another thing I have a problem with, because if you're looking at, I showed you guys last week, the bottle of ibuprofen from Walmart, it does not say where it was manufactured. It says who distributes it and where they're located. So I kind of think that a lot of these companies now are trying to um, not necessarily hide, but maybe they don't want to say that the drug was made in India or China or Israel or Norway. And I'm not really sure why, because we get a lot of good drugs from those companies. Um, there's not necessarily a problem with them, but they want to look like everything came from the U.S. when in many times it does not. And it also has to, the label also has to state the net quantity of contents in the metric and U.S. customary units. So all the cough syrup that you will find has milliliters and ounces listed. Bruce. So my little Cocker Spaniel mixed dog is over on the side of the, of the room here on the couch and he's pretending that he's going to chew up the couch if I don't come and pay attention to him. Hold on just a moment. Honey? If you could take the dog out, he's growling at me. He wants me to come play with him. Oh. Yeah. And could you let me know uh, when it's 1015? Yes, thank you. Okay, so US and uh, customary units and metric, it has to be on all of the labels of medications. In 1970, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act, we also call this the Controlled Substances Act. Okay, so this established the Drug Enforcement Administration. So it's not a bureau, um, it's an administration, not an agency. So it's a lot larger than an agency. And I had a DEA officer tell me this. So I always make sure that I tell everyone it's an administration. And this enforces the laws covering controlled substances and their distribution. So it created this stair step um, category of controlled substances. And one of the things I want to do is make sure that I put the controlled substances list in the files on Canvas so you guys can take a look at it. Because it's, uh, uh, that's not helpful, dear. Here. Now they're in here growling and fighting here. with each other. They're play fighting. Go outside. Go outside, Bruce. There you go. Okay, they have a doggy door, but they tend to forget and they want to play in here and they can go outside in the backyard and play. Okay, so uh, the five-level five stair-step schedule, schedules one through five, this is based on the drug's intended medical use, how uh, likely is the drug to be abused, and the safety and dependency concerns. Um, so it's basically based on how addictive a drug is. And the more addictive a drug is, the more likely it is to be abused. Okay, so um, this doesn't give you uh, this particular PowerPoint. I forgot to put in the basic differences. So schedule one has no legal use in the United States. And there are some drugs on it. In fact, marijuana is still a schedule one at the federal level. However, a lot of states have allowed it to um, be even, even used recreationally, um, because a lot of states have decided that it's not as addictive as the federal government thought that it was when it originally put it in a Schedule One. So it may be changed eventually, but we in the healthcare industry have to be careful because a lot of doctors and a lot of our employers still think of marijuana as addictive and dangerous, and it kind of they they think that it goes toward our character. So that is not something that I would indulge in right before I get hired and drug tested if I were you, okay? Also, um, 
LSD is Schedule I, but they're still doing research on it. So Schedule I drugs like marijuana and LSD and things like, um, um, I'm trying to think of another one. Ecstasy is another one, um, which I believe is MDMA, but I could be wrong about that because I'm not up on my illegal drugs. <clears throat> but um, they're allowed to do research on these drugs. So, but they have to get uh, specific reasons why, what they're looking for, what they aim to prove or disprove with the research, and they control the amount that the university or the lab can use for research. Schedule two is the most highly addictive drugs that are still legal for use, things like morphine. And a few years ago, they put Vicodin and Norco on that list, which is um, hydrocodone with Tylenol. Now, what's happening, what was happening originally with Vicodin and Norco is that people would show up in the emergency room overdosing on those drugs. But then when they did blood work, they found out that the patient was actually in liver failure because of the Tylenol or acetaminophen that's included in those drugs. Acetaminophen is a really good pain reliever and it works extremely well when combined with other drugs like hydrocodone or hydromorphone. Um, so people were taking more of them because they wanted the high that they got from the hydrocodone, but then they were actually overdosing on the acetaminophen that's contained in those, um, in those drugs. So if they, whether they were taking them to get high or whether they were taking them for pain relief, which a lot of people legitimately were taking them for pain relief, they would end up in the emergency room in liver failure. So they decided to make them Schedule two just to kind of control a little bit more how much a patient is taking. Fentanyl is a Schedule two drug also, and it's much, much stronger than hydrocodone. So based on the drugs and in, uh, in intended medical use, so we have to have drugs that are able to control pain. People die of cancer every single day, and the pain is excruciating. I sat with my mother for four days while she died from gallbladder cancer, and it was terrible. Um, but we, we still, we can't just say, oh, let's get rid of all these drugs. We have to have them. It was the only thing that controls their pain or gives them a little bit of control over their pain because at some point, you know, the pain just becomes excruciating. Schedule three drugs, uh, um, by the way, schedule two drugs have no um, refill. You, the doctor cannot write for a refill. So if they want, um, if they need a refill or if they use all of the medication and they need to get more, they have to get a new prescription every time. Schedule three drugs, a doctor can write for up to uh, five refills on a schedule three drug and same with schedule four. So these are drugs that are less likely to be abused because they're less addicting. So as you go down the stair steps. Um, schedule five is the lowest schedule of controlled substances um, and includes things like drugs with a small amount of codeine that are like cough syrups and things like that. Um, and Lomatil is a Schedule 5, it's for diarrhea, but it does tend to be sort of a muscle relaxant for people, um, although it's not listed as a muscle relaxant. It causes, you know, people to feel very mellow and relaxed um, because it's slowing down the GI tract so that they don't have diarrhea. So those are Schedule 5 and there's not a limit placed on those refills. Um, the prescription itself is good for six months. So once a prescription is written for a controlled substance, they can fill that prescription for up to six months. But um, if they wait a couple of months to fill it, then the pharmacist is going to ask, why did you wait to fill this, especially if it's a pain med? Most people that get strong pain medications, they need to fill it immediately. Okay, uh, 1970 also gave us the Poison Prevention Packaging Act, requires all medications to be placed in containers with childproof packs uh, caps or packaging. These are over-the-counter and prescription drugs. Um, legend, of course, means prescription. The standard specifies that the medication should not be able to be opened by at least 80% of children under the age of five, and that at least 90% of adults should be able to open the medication. Um, so, of course, our little joke is, oh, you can't get your medication open? Here, hand it to a little child. So there's a couple of ways to do that. One is the push and turn cap, and the other one is this type of cap. 
which has a little lever on it and if you pull it if you pull the lever down like it doesn't want to open if you pull the lever down it opens or you can put the cap on upside down and it's completely uh, non-child resistant as long as the patient can open it can twist it they can open it or if they put the cap on this way now it's child resistant okay so they have to call it they, they don't call it child proof anymore because we know better nothing is child proof so if the physician requests a non-child proof cap or the patients require a non-child proof cap um, certain le legend medications such as nitroglycerin tablets, inhalers, and oral contraceptives don't have to have um, child-proof caps. And the reason for the nitroglycerin sublingual tablet exemption is because when patients are having severe chest pain, they have to be able to open that up and quickly place a tablet under their tongue. And in the hospital, medications do not have to be dispensed in a child-proof cap or child-resistant cap because the patient is being given the medication by a nurse and hopefully there's no little children around. 1970, we also had the Occupational Safety and Health Act. That's where we get the word OSHA. So if you've heard of OSHA, um, that is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They ensure job safety and sets health standards for employees. So for instance, if someone has, um, tuberculosis and in the hospital we have to get TB tested every year or if they have something else that's highly um, highly dangerous like COVID they're allowed to tell the patient to stay home until you know until they get over that and the other thing like the safety standards when you walk into say a warehouse there has to be a light switch within reach of the door um, you don't want to walk into a warehouse in the dark and trip over something, right? People can fall and break their neck and literally die. So there has to be um, a light switch very close to the door. So that's one example. There's a whole lot of other examples for things like forklifts and dangling cords and all kinds of things like that. So it also maintains a reporting system for job-related injuries. It reduces workplace has hazards and audits to ensure compliance. It also requires the use of safety data sheets. We used to call these material safety data sheets, and these were provided by the seller of the product to the purchaser. And this contains important chemical information, um, mainly things like, uh, is this product flammable? You know, like alcohol, um, isopropyl alcohol is flammable um, at a certain percentage, in a very low percentage, actually. It needs to be at least 64%. I think now this year with COVID, they've raised it to 70%. They like to see in hand sanitizer. So isopropyl alcohol is what is in hand sanitizer that causes it to kill germs. Um, so these safety data sheets also say what to do if you get it on your skin. And also hazard communication standards. You have to have a sign on something to say, <coughs> you know, that it's hazardous. So one of the funny things about these safety data sheets, Purell san hand sanitizer contains alcohol. It contains isopropyl alcohol, or it could be ethyl alcohol. Now, ethyl alcohol is interesting because it's the alcohol that is in, um, that is in um, alcohol that people drink. We call that wood alcohol, but it's ethyl alcohol. So vodka, rum, whiskey, bourbon, um, wine, all of those things contain ethyl alcohol. And if you buy some hand sanitizer that has not been denatured, um, it will actually smell a little bit like rum. And so they put, because they don't want people to drink it because it's at least 70%, um, and so it can actually kill people um, if they drink a lot of it. Um, they put something that denatures it. So for most products, what they put in there is acetone. Now acetone is paint thinner and it's nail polish remover, okay? So if you open a hand sanitizer that's ethyl alcohol that's been denatured, you might actually have it smell like nail polish remover or smell like a nail salon. And so a lot of people, um, 
um, don't like that scent and that's why they scent a lot of hand sanitizers. So I, I think one of the best scents in hand sanitizer, because I have a recipe to make hand sanitizer and um, you know, you can scent it with, with your perfume. You can make hand sanitizer that smells like your perfume. Um, if you have, a, or um, aftershave or cologne, um, because those things also contain alcohol. So you can put them in your hand sanitizer and it will make them smell like those things. But one of the freshest smells is to put something like um, grapefruit um, oil in it. And you can get those. I used to get all of my supplies at, um, at the grocery store down the spice aisle. And um, what is that? Not Aldi's, that other um, grocer. I can't think of the name of it now. Um, but it's a popular warehouse type grocer store. And they have a lot of, of those types of um, flavorings and oils and scents. Um, so that's where I would get all of my ingredients to make hand sanitizer. So it's kind of fun. Okay, so talking about hand sanitizer, getting back to the point of this whole thing with Purell hand sanitizer, because it contains alcohol, it has to have a safety data sheet. And the safety data sheet says that if you get it on your hands, you should wash your hands with soap and water. Seriously, that's pretty funny. Okay. Um, also, the Federal Food and Drug Act was rewritten to incorporate false drug claims regarding their effectiveness. So in 1970, we finally updated this 1906 act. So, um, you know, for 64 years, it was just as is, but then we keep amending it. So, and then manufacturers have to prove the effectiveness of their drugs through scientific studies. So let's look for just a minute at scientific studies compared to something we call anecdotal evidence. An anecdote, A-N-E-C-D-O-T-E, -E, means a story. So if you pull up something like uh, tinnitus or gout, you're going to get all kinds, well, the first three ads you get on any Google search are going to be um, ads. And so that's your first, your first top three to five um, hits are going to be ads of things they want to sell you. And then your next uh, ones are going to be your next um, results are going to be anecdotes. You know, I had tinnitus and then I put this oil in my ear every night and it went away. Well, tinnitus doesn't happen in your ear. It happens in your brain. They also call it tinnitus. I think I, I pronounce it wrong all these years because that's how I grew up hearing it. My dad had it and I have it as well. So putting oil in your ear does not cure tinnitus or tinnitus, um, just so you know. So but there is a lot, they don't have a cure for it. So there's a lot of different things that they think help make it uh, less loud for patients. And some of those things I've been able to try and they didn't work and other things I haven't had a chance to try yet because they're still doing university studies on them. A lot of them are listening to tones that mimic your tinnitus so that your brain gets tired of hearing it. So maybe it doesn't produce it as much, but um, I'm not sure uh, on that one yet. I'm still waiting to hear the outcome of that. So scientific studies are where there has to be a large group of people that do this under the same circumstances. This is why they always chose uh, men between the ages of 21 and 50 or something like that to do these studies on because they figured they would have very similar um, body types and that the drugs would work very similar on these people. Well, we're realizing that we need to do more studies on different races, different genders, especially. Um, and okay, hang on, there we go. Um, and different types of people, elderly people. And obviously, you can't study drugs on children because they can't give informed consent. So we have things that, uh, like if a child is dying of cancer and you want to have, their main problem is pain, and so you want to see if something will help their pain, if the parents approve, you can use something off book. So I don't know if you listened to last week's lecture, I hope you did. Um, off book use means that it's something that doctors say to use for a condition that it's not, that the drug was not initially studied for. So because of that, now we have evidence compiled from hospitals all over the world that certain things will work for certain um, conditions. So 
that type of thing is considered a scientific study, even though it may not have gone through all of the um, the same rigors that a new drug has to go through. So using a drug for something different also has to do some you know, studies, but they're a little bit different. Okay, so the 1972 Drug Listing Act amends the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. It prevents the unfair or deceptive packaging and labeling. It provides a list of all drugs made by an establishment to the FDA. So if you're gonna open, say, um, you know, a company that makes aspirin, then you have to list everything else you make in, in your um, establishment. You have to tell the FDA what you're making. This also, in 1972, assigned a specific 11-digit number to identify every product that a company makes. It's called the National Drug Code, or the NDC number. The first five digits identify the manufacturer, the next four digits identify the drug product, and the last two digits identify the package size and packaging. So I'm going to grab my ibuprofen bottle again and show you the NDC number. I'll be right back. So the way this looks is that I get everything at Walmart, and that is not true. I buy things where I think that I will find products that have gone through <laughs> um, FDA packaging. Um, so I know that they're probably going to be what they say they are, but I can get them from anywhere. Um, I bought meds at Target and the grocery store and CVS and Walgreen and also Walmart. So here's my ibuprofen bottle. And right here is the NDC number. And I apologize since it's kind of blurry. So the NDC number is 49035-604-85. So here is Pain reliever, which is acetaminophen, 500 milligrams. This is extra strength Tylenol. So now you guys know I get headaches and sometimes back pain. So there is the NDC number for that. So take a look at your over-the-counter medications at home. They will all have an NDC number. This one is 49035-494-01. Okay, so they all start with 49035 because these were all made by the same company uh, for Walmart, probably. Now, this is a bottle of calcium, 600 milligrams with D3, which is cholecalciferol, which helps the bones absorb the calcium. Am I going to open it? Yes, I did. Apparently, I took a few. I don't take as much calcium as I should. If you look at this label, there's no NDC number on it. Some calcium will have an NDC number, some will not. It kind of depends because this is considered a supplement, quote unquote supplement, and because of the 2005 Supplement Act, if a drug or a, a product is not wanting to be considered a drug, then it doesn't have to be regulated like a drug as long as it has this disclaimer on it. And this disclaimer, which you find on all supplements, says this statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, first of all. And then this product, it doesn't call itself a drug. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease, okay? Another one is mitigate. So by law, if something is considered a drug, it must diagnose, treat, cure, prevent, or mitigate a disease or a medical condition because drugs by law are intended to 
uh, affect the structure or function of the human body or the body because drugs are for, there are drugs for animals as well. So uh, a living organism, if you are going to um, affect the structure or function of the organism, it's a drug. Okay, so now you find all kinds of people saying, oh, take garlic, take this, take that, okay? And yes, they can affect the function of the human body. So in my opinion, the laws that we have um, regarding supplements like calcium with D3, um, they don't really go far enough, but as long as no harm is done, then I'm not gonna make this the hill that I die on, as somebody used to say. In other words, this isn't the fight that I'm going to uh, make a big deal over. I mention it, of course, but I'm going to get off my soapbox because, uh, you know, it's, it's something I think is interesting. It's not necessarily um, something that I want to, you know, start picketing or striking or, um, you know, um, standing on the street corner about. Okay, so the first five digits identify the manufacturer, the next four digits identify the drug product, and the last two digits identify the package size and packaging. So is it uh, an injectable? Is it in 10 milliliters? Is it a pint of syrup? Is it a bottle of 250 tablets? Or is it a bottle of 100 tablets? And so the first five digits are gonna be the same for everything that manufacturer makes but the next four digits say ibuprofen 200 milligrams. This one says 604, okay? And that's only three digits. That's because we put an invisible, what we call a leading zero in front of it. So if I were to write this on an insurance form, I would make it 0604, okay? So that means 200 milligram ibuprofen tablets, but it only means it to the company that makes it for Walmart. So if I were to buy ibuprofen 200 milligram tablets from some, some other company, it, would it wouldn't say 0604, it would say something else because they're allowed to make up the rest of the, of the number as long as it's consistent within their organization, okay? And here's where I would say, does that make sense? And hopefully I would get several people nodding their heads. So this is why um, it's difficult for me to teach without feedback. <laughs> okay. 1976, we call this one RECRA, Research Conservation, Resource, sorry, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. So this is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and they produce these federal guidelines regarding the disposal of hazardous waste. Because even now, if I go get tap water or even bottled water that I buy in a store, it will or it can contain things like fluoxetine, which is Prozac, or estradiol, which is estrogen found in birth control pills. Um, and we have no way of really getting rid of that or filtering it out of our drinking water, even bottled water, you guys. So because of that, we discovered in 1976 that a lot of this stuff was showing up. And one of the things that especially was showing up was um, the polio vaccine out of baby diapers. Yeah, seriously, isn't that disgusting? So the FDA said, well, the reason they're getting in there, some of it we can't control. For instance, when drugs are flushed out of our system through urination or defecation, it goes down into the sewer and eventually ends up back in water, you know, that we drink, hopefully through a lot of processes and a lot of time. However, uh, we used to flush drugs down the toilet in the pharmacy. So I have a funny story about that. Um, at a lucky grocery store that I worked in, happened to be in Riverside, um, the pharmacy was right next to produce. So you could look out of our pharmacy window and there'd be a line of people and then right next to them would be all of the produce. And so when we would have a drug that would expire, we knew we wouldn't get a lot of money for it if we sent it to a reverse distributor, but we did send a lot of stuff to a reverse distributor and sometimes we would get money for them and we still do um, because they can sell them to third world countries or they can reuse the drugs in, in other um, you know, where you, you um, what they would do is isolate the active ingredient and make another form out of it because they could control how much active ingredient or they could measure it. 
Okay, so if we weren't going to do that, we would actually flush them down the toilet and we would get the manager of produce coming over and saying, uh, you know, your pills are coming up in our sink, right? Literally. And so that was a plumbing issue and we would have to call the plumber in to fix it. And every once in a while we would have um, Brussels sprouts and broccoli and lettuce coming up in our toilet in the pharmacy. We had a very tiny little bathroom at the back of the pharmacy. And yeah, that was not really good design on the part of the, of the um, grocery store architect to have the plumbing for the pharmacy right next to the produce. So yeah, it was funny. Not that, I mean, nothing was getting contaminated with either wastewater or tablets, but you know, it just, that doesn't look good, right? It doesn't look good to go in to use the restroom and, and find broccoli floating in your toilet. So, I'm, you know, they fixed that while I was there, thank goodness. Okay, so we can't flush these things anymore. And so there's definite ways to get rid of things. And one of them is, okay, doesn't say here. One of them is what we call, um, what do we call that? The black bin or the black waste. Um, there's P-listed waste, U-listed waste, and then um, black waste. So all of that has to go into a bin. Now, they used to say that these bins had to be black, and they would literally be a round container, either plastic or metal, with a lid that locks, okay? So, and then what they do is um, they throw that away, but they take it directly to the landfill and put it in the landfill so that people can't dig it up. It contains things like insulin, um, anything that contains phenol or menthol. It contains the, uh, the um, inhalers because they have a propellant and that propellant is flammable and it can explode if it's exposed to too much heat. So um, that is uh, the way that they dispose of a lot of these things. So what they suggest people do is take a coffee can or something like that, some large container, and put their pills in it, or even leaving it in its original container if you just have a few left, but put something like dirt from the yard or, um, or water that will dissolve it, and then tape the lid shut and throw it in with your regular trash, because then hopefully by the time it, the container itself um, either breaks apart or gets squashed, or if the container, um, that's why they want you to tape the lid so the lid won't pop off. Um, by the time that container is compromised and open, then hopefully what's inside there will have degraded so that it's no longer a drug, you know, which we don't know how long these things um, are still hazardous, okay? All right, the 1983 Orphan Drug Act. The Orphan Drug Act allows drug companies to bypass the lengthy time required for testing a new drug and the cost that accompanies the testing to provide a medication to people who have a rare disease. We have a medication, um, we have had in the past many times, medications for, for babies that were born with these rare diseases. And sometimes these drugs are, um, one family was going to end up paying $500,000 for the very first year of treatment for this baby. And the drug companies are able to then uh, provide these at a lower price and because they're partially funded by the government because of the Orphan Drug Act. Um, so most of the time with a new drug, it takes 12 to 15 years to get from the lab, and, and it starts out as computer modeling, so maybe there isn't even anything that physically exists. It's just an idea for a drug. Now, when these drugs go through this human, go through this testing, only one in 5,000 drugs go through the in vitro testing and animal testing and then get to human testing. Uh, one in 5,000 because they have all these drugs in the pipeline. And then one out of those, of every five drugs that gets to human testing are actually approved for use. So that means that if you agree to, um, to uh, participate in a clinical trial, you might get a placebo or you might get a drug that ultimately does not get approved for human testing. Now there are some good, there's a lot of good side effects to this. First of all, you know, we don't have a lot of drugs out there that turned out to not be good for what we thought they were. Another thing is, 
if a drug passes animal testing but doesn't pass human testing, sometimes they can use it for animal use. There's a drug called carprofen. Carprofen, so looking at this bottle of ibuprofen, it kind of gives you an idea of what it was originally intended for. They tried to have it for arthritis because it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And they came out with a brand name Rimadyl, R-I-M-A-D-Y-L, and it's carprofen. I think originally they were going to call it carbiprofen. That's how I heard about it. Um, but now the generic name is just carprofen. And it worked really well for elderly dogs for arthritis. However, with people, it caused too much stomach upset and ulcers even. So people's stomachs couldn't handle the drug. So they decided to market it to vets for dogs. And it's only for dogs, it's not for cats. Um, cats' physiology is so much different from dogs that there are a lot of drugs that are only for dogs or only for cats, but not for both. For instance, um, Tylenol, I've heard, is extremely toxic to cats. So never give your cat Tylenol. Okay, so the Orphan Drug Act was especially <clears throat> so that drug companies can develop drugs for rare diseases because they're not gonna sell a lot of them. So why should they go to the trouble of making them, right? So this gives them a monetary incentive. 1984 Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act. 1984, a lot of interesting things happened. I had my first child and he's now a grown man, um, obviously. To me, 1984 seems like yesterday, but to a lot of my students, you know, it was like before they were born. Um, so this Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act encourages the creation of both generic and new medications. It streamlined the process for generic drug approval and extended the patent licenses. So that drug companies that come up with new drugs, they have a patent and a trademark on this drug. And so no other drug company can make it for a period of years until the patent expires. Once the patent expires, then another drug company can make a generic version of that drug, but it still has to follow the same approval process. It has to show safety and efficacy, which is why these are not Advil brand tablets, which is the brand name of ibuprofen. It's also not Motrin, which was the original uh, prescription drug name of ibuprofen. So Motrin and Advil are both brand names for ibuprofen. They also said that they could not advertise prescription drugs. Um, they couldn't advertise prescription drugs on television uh, before this. After this, now they're allowing them to um, advertise prescription drugs but they have to list all the side effects, which is why you'll hear all of this beautiful guitar music playing in the background and it's always very peaceful. And in the meantime, someone is saying like, may cause drowsiness, dizziness, ulcers, heart attacks, or death, right? So I always think that's highly amusing because they're allowed to say it or they must say it, but they're also allowed to play that beautiful music and have someone say it in a very non-threatening way. Okay, the Prescription Drug Marketing Act of 1987, which is when my second child was born, helps prevent counterfeit drugs and ingredients from entering the supply chain. It limits the diversion of pharmaceutical samples and prescription drugs. So the word diversion, to me, it sounds like the Spanish word for fun. <laughs> Um, but what it actually means is if you're diverting something, you're diverting it from the path it's supposed to be on, from the drug company to the manufacturer to the pharmacy to the patient that it's prescribed for. So misusing drugs is a form of diversion. Selling drugs that are not uh, illegally selling them for a purpose that they're not intended for, like for recreational use, is diversion of drugs. So they would give, uh, the pharmaceutical companies would give doctor's offices um, samples of these drugs and they would just hand them out to everybody, like, you know, whether they really needed them or not. Try this, see if it makes your headache feel better. Um, and so this Prescription Drug Marketing Act 
limited that and it's why that most doctor's offices don't have quite so many samples as they used to have. They used to give them samples left and right and now they don't give as many samples. OPRA 87, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, established extensive revisions to Medicare and Medicaid. Um, the conditions of participation um, concerning long-term facilities, long-term care facilities, and pharmacy, okay? So basically, these long-term care facilities, that's where patients actually live there because they can't live at home or they have a medical condition where they're bedridden. Um, so, you know, this is what we used to call like the homes. Um, a lot of times the, the people running those homes would keep them medicated like all the time so that they didn't have to basically deal with them. So they would over medicate them so that they would keep them quiet and calm. And um, so the law said that they couldn't do that anymore. Their drug regimen must be free of unnecessary medications. But they also have routine and emergency medications that have to be provided to the patients. They have to be stored in locked compartments at the proper temperatures according to both federal and state laws. Long-term care facilities must have the services of a consultant pharmacist. This is where we have closed door pharmacies. They provide medications to these long-term care facilities and they actually go out to these facilities. And I, I've had uh, former students who work there and go with the pharmacist to these facilities and they check their records, they check and make sure that patients haven't had any new drug orders or that they're still ordered the medications that they're actually brought to the pharmacy. If the patients have antipsychotic medications, because a lot of those will keep them calm, they must have a documented diagnosis that warrants their use and also must receive gradual dose tapering. So if they're on an antipsychotic medication, high doses of these medications will keep them in bed basically and asleep. So they have to gradually taper the dose to a point that the patient can function as in get up and go to the bathroom by themselves, feed themselves, take care of their basic hygiene, take a shower, that sort of thing. Now maybe they have to sit in the tub and not take a standing shower because there's a high amount of falling that takes place um, with elderly people and with patients on antipsychotic medications when they have to stand and take a shower. Um, it's the temperature of the water, it's the fact that water is falling on them, the fact that their eyes are closed, a lot of times they fall, okay? Uh, that's with elderly and um, also with a lot of patients that are in these homes, okay? This is my favorite law. This is called OBRA 90, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Okay, so the act is the law. Reconciliation is where they're trying to come up with a budget that they can live with. An omnibus, think of it as, think of it as everyone get on the bus. Okay, omnibus means everything. So everything that is not approved for a budget at the time that a, um, a government body meets to come up with a budget and they end up fighting and arguing and having these filibusters and where they stand and talk for six days and they're not allowed to be interrupted. Um, when they finally decide, okay, we're gonna break and go, you know, cause Christmas is tomorrow and they decide to take a break and this happens a lot um, in Congress. Um, then they will come up with an OBRA, an Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Now, things like that, road in um, Alaska that doesn't go anywhere. That was in an OBRA law, okay? So they decided to throw this Medicare, Medicaid thing in there and pass it as well. And it ended up being uh, serendipitous for me and many, many other pharmacy assistants, pharmacy clerks, because California did not have any laws on the books whatsoever in 1990 about pharmacy technicians. After this law was passed, now, all of a sudden, who is going to count the pills? Who is going to put them in the bottle and label them? We were allowed to type prescriptions because it was considered a secretarial type job and anybody could do it if they know how to spell the medications, right? Okay, so we were allowed to type prescriptions. We were allowed to sell them to the patient. We were not allowed to touch the drugs, except when the order comes in, we can put it away, of course. 
So it was kind of interesting what we were allowed and not allowed to do in California, and there were not a lot of laws about it. But what this job, what this law specifically talks about is practicing pharmacists. Um, now, Medicare and Medicaid said that pharmacists can tell people on Medicare and Medicaid about their medications, but they don't have to because they're not going to be paid for it. So a lot of pharmacists would not take the time to go to the counter and talk to the patients about, thank you, about their medications, okay? Um, so not only did this provide, it required manufacturers to provide the lowest prices to any customer or Medicaid patients by rebating each state Medicaid agency the difference between its average price and its lowest price. Um, it also, so it had to do with, with pricing medications, which was a good thing for elderly people on Medicare and Medicaid, right? And also people who have chronic issues, like patients that are in a wheelchair and can't work. Um, it also required pharmacists to counsel at the time of purchase all patients who receive new prescriptions. And if they, because Medicare and Medicaid is big business for pharmacies, okay? And if they don't, talk to the patients about their medications, um, they could lose a loss of Medicaid funds and or fines. So they can be fined and they can lose that business. So that, you know, pharmacies could, could go bankrupt and go out of business if they can't deal, if they can't get reimbursed by Medicare and Medicaid. So now we have this thing called MTM, Medication Therapy Management, and Medicare and Medicaid pay pharmacists to do this uh, consultation with patients. So now if all of the pharmacists, oh, and here's the other thing, because we don't always know, the patients will have say an Aetna card or Pacificare or Kaiser. We don't know if they have Medicare or Medicaid when they go to pick up their prescription. Because of that, pharmacists now, at least in California, the California State Board of Pharmacy interpreted this law to say that you have to offer consultation on all new prescriptions, all of them. Okay, so now if all of the pharmacists are at the counter talking to patients about their medication, which, you know, nowadays pharmacists are doctors of pharmacy. They are experts on drugs. They're supposed to be. So they need to go talk to patients about their medications. And we need to do this medication uh, therapy management so that they don't have the same drug from three different doctors and not know it and it all lowers their blood pressure and they end up with super low blood pressure or vice versa. So if pharmacists are doing that, then who's going to count the pills? Who's going to pour them in the bottle and put the label on and all of that? So they don't have to do all that stuff now because now California decided to license technicians. So I was grandfathered, which means that I had been working in pharmacy long enough to apply for a license. And then I went back to school. So I kind of did this backwards, but you know, it worked for me. And now I've been in pharmacy uh, for more than 30 years. Okay, so this is my favorite law because immediately when I became licensed, I'm now eligible to, um, to make more money basically because now the job that I do requires more, um, you know, more education, more technique, more skill. Okay, so um, this is the chapter two, it's all about pharmacy law. I'm gonna stop here at the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. Again, it's my favorite law. So um, I'm going to pick this up again next week. All right, so do you have any questions? I'm